Mr. Jeffy. Hi, EJ. It's so great to see you. We're really looking forward to working with you. It'll be a great reunion. I am so looking forward to coming back to Stockton to see you again, collaborate with you again. It's a wonderful journey of life each time. It really is. And I think the last time you were here was over a decade ago. I think you played the Butterfly Concerto. Yeah. And you really encouraged me to explore this piece. And I discovered through our collaboration how much it really meant to me. I'm happy that we shared that experience together. Thank you. You're most welcome and you're too kind. That was then and now <laughs> it's now. And so here's a completely different adventure, right? Yes. We've worked together on many different pieces over many different years, but I don't think together we've ever done the Brooke Scottish Fantasy. Have you played it many times before? I've played it several times. It's in my top five, which is, it's hard to squeeze in there. I didn't know you could even have a top five. You know, it's one of these pieces I don't think I could live without. So that's how it makes its way there. Well, that's terrific. So let's rewind quite a bit to okay. the very first time we collaborated together was at the Aspen Music Festival. And I remember specifically you were playing the Sarasate Carmen Plays. I remember a home video where I am exactly, precisely half your height. And I do remember you having to do some acrobatics to communicate with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So let's rewind even further. How old were you when you started playing the violin? My goodness. So I mentally started practicing when I was born, but I asked for my violin at three. And I think I was next to my parents who are both violinists and were practicing every single day. So I was just dreaming about my violin, but they had tried every single violin that they could find down to one sixteenth size. And it was still way too big for my <laughs> for my tiny tiny hands and so I had to wait a year for my father to carve a teeny tiny almost like 132nd he by... made one yes this is a really wonderful holiday story because we were in Canada it was very cold in Canada there was a fire and he saw my uncle throw a couple of pieces of wood into the fireplace and he said hey that's maple. And my uncle looks at his brother at the time. He said, yeah, you're in Canada. So there's a lot of maple. And he said, but it's quarter cut. I can make a violin out of that. And so he asked my uncle for a piece of firewood. Tough beginnings, humble beginnings in Canada at the time. So he couldn't even afford a proper chisel. So I remember he had attached like a razor blade onto the end of a pencil, which broke and he was bleeding like crazy. So my uncle actually bought him his first set of tools to make my first wow. item. It was really a labor of love and family support. And I think I grabbed it before he finished the chin rest and I never got a chin rest. He, he made one, but it never got attached because I had pounced on the violin right away. Wow. Once you started taking lessons, were you studying with your mom or your dad or both? Well, my father actually practiced with me. He taught me and we practiced two hours every single day, starting at age four. And how many years did you study with your dad? Well, he continued to teach me until I went to Juilliard. He brought me to Miss Delay. I was 12 years old. You're talking um, about Dorothy DeLay, the famous teacher. Right? Yes. I started studying with her at 12, and we would commute from Toronto to New York. Wow. That's a really big commitment for a 12-year-old and for your parents, too. Did you ever have a challenge of willpower? Like, man, it's getting to be a real chore. I don't know if I want to do this. Or were you just gung-ho all the way? I had a 24-hour period of doubt. I was 15 and I was preparing for, you know, international junior division level competitions. And the practicing was, you know, six, seven hours. I was not sleeping anymore because I was doing all my homework in the middle of the night and I was practicing all through the day. And and so I guess my teenage brain at the time was not really very rational. I was like, why? Well, you know, like, I can't go to any tea parties and birthday parties. And do I really have to do this? And to his extraordinary credit my father said no you don't have to do this 
then of course I would be very happy for you to continue, but this is your life and your choice. And I guess I was so shocked and I said, so I could just quit. And he was like, yeah. And so you I tried it. I did. I quit for a day. I um, <laughs> a day. I chose the day where it happened to land on a birthday party. <laughs> so I went to my birthday party. I came home, went to bed and couldn't sleep. It felt like I hadn't brushed my teeth. You know, it just felt wrong. Something was just utterly backwards. And so I went to my parents' room. They were already sleeping. And I remember staying up all night until about six o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. And I waited until there was some turning in the bed. And I went to my parents' bedside. And I was crying, tears streaming down my face. And I said, I, I, I want to play. I want to play. From that day forward, every single morning, I still have this feeling of being like the luckiest person in the world that I can wake up and do what I love. That's magnificent. So getting to today's career for you, yeah. what is your mix like in terms of making music on the violin? Is it mainly concerto appearances all around the world? Is it recitals? Do you play chamber music? Do you do any teaching? What's the whole life for you like now? It was a really beautiful mix. And then, of course, COVID kind of changed everything. So I did a overhaul of my own training. So I zapped back to age eight when I started my Pagnini Caprices. So I started retraining as if I was just learning violin for the first time. You know, it was renovation time. So well, and just a second, just a second. How many eight-year-olds can play the Paganini Caprices? Well, I, I couldn't yet. That's when I started. When I was eight years old, my father started teaching me Paganini Violin Concerto. And then very soon after, he was helping me to stretch my hands. In fact, my left hand um, pinky finger grew longer than the right hand, probably as a result of all those stretching and acrobatics that he had me doing at that age. Yeah, so I revisited my own training and I did some mentoring the young artists and teaching online and I did a couple of little online performances, but it's still not the same. The energy level is not the same. So I'm very happy to come back to playing live. How about hobbies outside of music or is it just, you know, laser focus on playing the violin? I love cooking. I'm a chocoholic. Yeah, that's one of the major food groups, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's actually very healthy. And I also love snowboarding, you know, what now ice skating, you know, I grew up in Canada, so a lot of winter sports. I do believe that every experience filters and gets processed into my music. Didn't you make a video with you strolling around on a set playing the violin in the midst of some chocolate factory or something? Can you remind me about that? Yeah, it was called The Devil's Delight, uh -huh. and it was an indulgent project from beginning to end. And I think indulgent is a good word. I eventually did eat the sculpture. I, I went home with it <laughs> for like a good part of the year. I just sat and looked at it, but I'm like, I mean, this is eventually going to go bad. I can't let this go to waste. Oh, no. Beautiful yeah, job. That would be horrible. Demolish it, devouring it. Well... It's so great that we're having yet another reunion and all of us are looking so forward to having you here out to Stockton in just a couple of weeks. And it's going to be marvelous working with you. Thank you. Okay. See you next week. We'll see you soon.